Apocalypse now, apocalypse when. Is Armageddon upon us? If you're a doomsday prepper, you're already getting ready for what you regard as the inevitable, the decline, the deterioration of society. In my podcast, Under the Skin, I speak to Bradley Garrett, who explains to me beautifully some of the components of being a doomsday prepper. Survivalists, what are our assumptions about them? Should you be preparing for the breakdown of society is it closer than we think with the all prevailing pandemic, with the treachery, deceptions, lies and peculiarity? Should we all be preparing for the end of the world now? In this conversation with Bradley Garrett, we cover a lot of these issues and learn a lot and actually feel quite optimistic about Armageddon as a result. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you want to listen to this whole conversation, go over to Luminary and subscribe. You get this podcast all of the podcasts where once a week I talk to someone deep and Above the Noise, my meditation podcast. Wherever you are in the world, you can listen to Luminary via Apple. It's available everywhere. The link's in the description below. Check them all out. Thank you. And the other thing that sort of struck me is when you said about, like, you know, about reality, that sometimes when I was younger and I would think about violence, that somehow, like, a violent confrontation strips away all of the various edifices that we voluntarily or otherwise live behind. And like, if someone says, I'm going to kill you or punches you in the face, like now you are like, oh, fuck, yeah, stuff like that can just happen. Like, it doesn't matter that I've yeah. learned these things, <laughs> you know, where is it now? Yeah, you're exactly right. And and the the doomsday preppers or survivalists that I've been spending years living with have, you know, they they explained to me that in some sense they were looking forward to a disaster <clears throat> because it ruptures the illusion. Um, the bunker, you know, whether you think about that as a physical space or a kind of metaphor, um, is, is, a, is a space for recreation. It's a space of rebirth, essentially, right? I mean, if you, if you don't emerge from the bunker, it's a tomb. Uh, so, so, the, so the bunker um, uh, is a space of rebirth, but it's also a space of control. And because so many aspects of our lives now are not with our control. I think that that's something that people seek, you know, they, they, they want to create a space where they know they can control the parameters of their existence. And that moment of being in the bunker, uh, you know, surrounded by the things that you've put together, uh, self-sufficient, cut off from the world, is precisely uh, akin to that moment of violence that, that you're describing, right? It's, it's a moment of radical confrontation with our existence, you know, that where, where the veneer has been stripped away and, and we're back to the basics. And I think, you know, a lot of us crave that on some level also because, you know, society and civilization originally was built upon a premise of, of mutual understanding, of cooperation, of human connection, connection with the natural world, right? And that now has been occluded by these, these social, economic, and political structures that um, are, are fundamentally unsatisfying on some level. And so what many of the preppers told me was that the disaster is a moment for rebirth, for recreation, for reconnection. Um, and so, I mean, strangely, there is an anxiety there underlying things, but there's also a hopefulness that when the disaster comes, it's, it's a moment for us to confront ourselves and potentially to rebuild the world. And this is a perfect moment to be talking to you because, you know, we're in that moment now. I mean, we, we have an opportunity to reshape things after going through a global disaster that's killed, what, almost 4 million people now. Um, we have a moment to uh, build a different kind of world. Whether we're going to rise up to that challenge, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, but it's certainly a time of, of change, and that's exactly what these preppers had been telling me uh, long before the pandemic had hit. Cool. A few things there, Bradley. One, like the cave, the bunker, you know, I think of Christ, you know, and like yeah. the moment in the cave, that's so cool. That Like that's a moment before rebirth. And I also think of the Kali energy in Hinduism, like the, the destroyer, that things have to be destroyed that we may be reborn. reborn. And of course, most m myths have that idea in, in agriculture itself requires a kind of death and burial for new crops to grow and stuff. Um, mate, this idea, that is are survivalists a homogenous sort of group or is there a lot of variety? Because when you just said that thing about the four million death, 
my assumption, this is my assumption about survivalists, and obviously I don't know anything like as much as you do. I only know what I've seen on documentaries and stuff. Like um, my assumption would be that survivalists are sort of libertarian, right wing, anti state, anti government. Part of the route being kind of like a, you know, the King of England could come over here at any moment. <laughs> we best tool up and get get ready, and that they would therefore be kind of anti vaccine. Would think that the pandemic was has been exaggerated, mobilised, misused, and that, that you know that its risks have been you know um, I don't know exaggerated or whatever. Um, uh, uh, wh where am I wrong with my assumptions there on the survivalists? Well, so there's a few things. Um, one is you're not wrong. There, those people do exist, <laughs> um, and there's not. You know, it's a bit of a misnomer to describe this is a community of people, you know, this is, I mean, there are people from, um, a full political spectrum that are ending up in these communities or adopting these practices. Uh, there's some great research, uh, that came out of Queens college. Anna Maria Bounds worked with, uh, inner city preppers in New York city, many of whom are black and who said, you know, we grew up in essentially a constant state of emergency um, dealing with crisis on a daily basis. And so they're, they're prepping so that they don't have to go through something like that again. Um, many of the communities that I went to, and now here I'm using community in the sense that, you know, a, a, a group of people who have moved into a set of bunkers in a place, we can talk about the, the bunkers themselves, um, but many of those people came from drastically different backgrounds. Um, uh, both vocationally and in terms of their demographics, politically across the spectrum. And what was fascinating to me is that uh, they were able to communicate around these shared methodologies, right? So, so you, start, you start with the thought experiment. If this happens, then what would I do, right? And then and then you start putting the preparations, the material preparations in place, the emotional, psychological preparations in place to be able to deal with those scenarios. So uh, the, the preppers that I worked with were able to sort of bypass their differences because they were, they were trying to work through these problems, these thought experiments on a, on a uh, you know, uh, cooperative basis. And often that meant building complementary skills uh, so that they could see each other through a disaster. They, they call these mutual assistance groups. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, again, there's a lot, there's a lot there to unpack, but <clears throat> the, uh, the community is sort of wider and more diverse than you might expect. And I'll tell you now that um, recent research has indicated that just in the United States alone, 13, almost 13 million people are prepared to go for 30 days without uh, any sort of infrastructure, food, water, power, grocery stores. That's an incredible statistic. I mean, it's almost 1% of the population is prepared uh, to weather 30 days on their own. So that gives you a sense of how many people are involved and how many different sorts of people are involved in the practice. That's so cool, Bradley. One thing is, like from the first part of what you're saying, it's like that abstract ideals about you know your cultural values around what we once would have regarded as the left and the right are irrelevant if you're involved in the project of building a community that survives that the culture that consists of those kind of debates uh, you know my in my view is kind of a distraction from important stuff um and two like one percent of the population that's enough to overthrow the government you know like uh like if it was the right one percent you know if you if you can if you can mobilize protest uh, civil disobedience a sort of you know i guess you'd need some strategy and some cohesion but like that's a significant number you know that's an impactful number maybe we should be looking at the apocalypse optimistically Apocam Optim no, I can't do a neologism made out of those two words. The point of it is this. 
that maybe we should be preparing for a better society. Maybe civilization needs to change. Hit me with your comments below. Subscribe to my channel. If you want to learn more about meditation, go over to Awakening and sign up for that. If you want to see me do my live Shakespeare show, there's a stream show in a couple of days. There's a link in the description below to that too. And if you want to come see me live, you can get tickets to that below as well. Sign up to my mailing list. I'll tell you about all of this stuff and we can stay completely connected. For the rest of this podcast, go over to Luminary. You can get it on Apple. Link, link, link. Description, description, description. Subscribe.